After the release of Grand Theft Auto San Andreas in 2004, Rockstar were one of, if not the biggest name on the gaming market. I've said it numerous times, but the GTA series created and perfected a new genre and pushed the boundaries of what was appropriate. But after Rockstar San Diego created a new Rockstar Advanced Game Engine, aka Rage in 2005, setting them up for the next generation. The next title in the GTA series would not be for another few years, which gave the controversial publisher a chance to release more games from different franchises. And one console released in that span was the PlayStation Portable. Rockstar Games attributes a lot of their early 2000s success on the PlayStation 2. So when Sony released the PSP worldwide by September 2005, Rockstar were already making their presence felt, releasing Midnight Club 3, The Warriors, and Manhunt 2 by the end of 2006. All of these ports were developed by Rockstar Leeds, formerly known as Mobius Entertainment Limited, who already had experience in the handheld market making mostly Game Boy Advance titles. Rockstar purchased the Yorkshire-based developer after they were impressed with the GBA port of Max Payne, and wanted to be just as strong in the expanding portable market after the success of the Game Boy Advance and release of the Nintendo DS and PlayStation Portable. In collaboration with Rockstar North, Leeds were given the task of creating a quote, full GTA game for the PSP that would see them return to Liberty City with a brand new story, returning characters, and a different timeline. The result was Grand Theft Auto Liberty City Stories, which was released for the PlayStation Portable on October 2005, the PlayStation 2 on June 2006, and the Mobile on December 2015. We're looking at the PlayStation 2 version. We won't be comparing it to Vice City Stories because it came out after LCS, so I'll be looking at it from the perspective of just experiencing GTA 3, Vice City and San Andreas, especially after reviewing all three recently. Set three years before the events of GTA 3, Antonio Cipriani, yep, yeah, this guy, has returned to Liberty City after going into hiding for killing a made man under the orders of Salvatore Leone. A war is ensuing between the three biggest mafia families in Liberty City. Antonio is tasked with keeping the Leone family relevant in Liberty City by completing jobs nobody else can do, and dealing with other people associated with the family whom you don't really trust. Anthony. It's over for guys like us. We're dinosaurs. Of all the returning characters Rockstar could have used as a playable one for a future GTA title, Tony was the right one. He was never mentioned in the predecessors and can handle himself just fine. Thanks. The return of Salvatore and Tony allows for GTA fans to immediately become familiar with Liberty City again, along with Donald Love, who plays a heavier role in the story as you assist him in his mayoral election. How's the campaign? It's down to the wire and every last vote's gonna count. Even Vice City characters including Phil Cassidy and Avery Harrington make a cameo, with Cassidy opening a heavy weapon shop south of Staunton Island. When you break it all down, the plot is a lot more straightforward. But whatever you do with the other characters affects the Leone family and the events that lead to GTA 3 without any serious continuity errors. Thing is, you know how each GTA title, or any Rockstar title for that matter, has a main antagonist that you love to hate because that's how well written they are. Here it's not clear who the antagonist is. Geez, Tony, Sal said you was dumb muscle. But I didn't think anyone was that dumb. You have a few characters that get under your skin, but don't play a huge role. It's like there's an antagonist on each island. When I tell you to do something, you do it, capiche? Also, it's easy to be distracted by returning characters and the gameplay itself. But as I've discussed in previous GTA reviews, the story is only a small percentage of the whole experience. I mean, in GTA 3, the cutscenes mostly consist of Claude being told what to do, and that's it. I mean, these are people that I personally fought for, people I've killed for, honest people, and this is how they repay it's me? It's insulting. It's a disgrace. One thing that continued to impress me was the continuity, no pun intended. 
Whenever there's a path, road, building or area that looks different from GTA 3 and LCS, a lot of these are the results of Tony's actions. For example, there's one part of the tunnel that's only used for one mission, but as you can see, it's in the middle of construction, and when you play GTA 3 it's complete, almost like everything else. Though it is understandable to assume that maybe too many buildings are under construction at one time, and it makes the city look like it's being built from nothing only a couple of decades ago. Go. A planned city way ahead of schedule, but aside from a half finished tunnel or a bridge with two small gaps, the map, road and storyline structure are very similar. There are markers scattered everywhere that trigger a mission and completing enough will unlock an island. But the biggest difference is the in-game map system. Okay, it was common in the GTA series by 2005, but there was no such thing in GTA 3, and it was a nightmare trying to reach the marker on a time limit without even realizing it's on another island. To not implement a map system in Liberty City Stories would be absurd, because it's not like you can carry a physical map with you all the time. Remember that this is a portable title. Unless he's a fool, he'll work it out soon enough. Perhaps we should help him. Safe houses can only be unlocked when you enter another island, but you can walk inside and change your outfit, which you'll have to do occasionally for a certain mission. That's right, you have a pretty diverse lineup of unique outfits. Although for a series that prides itself on pop culture references, there aren't as many here with the outfits being the most obvious. But if you look really hard, you will find references to the GDA predecessors. It took a while to reach this spot again, no, I can't get enough. I need to prove my point. On the PSP version, it says, hello again. While I was playing Liberty City Stories, I had to keep reminding myself that it's a PlayStation Portable game. Having a fully fledged 3D Grand Theft Auto title to play on the go is brilliant. And when you're using a new game engine and rebuilding Liberty City from scratch, it's not going to be an easy transition, especially if Rockstar North weren't the primary developers. For a handheld console not as powerful as the PlayStation 2, to create 95% of GTA 3 Liberty City is technically impressive. Which is why things like texture pop-ins and brightness incorrections shouldn't draw you away from the game altogether. But there's one thing I cannot excuse, and you'll notice at the moment you control Tony, the slowdown. It's among the worst I've ever come across in a video game. You'd assume it happens occasionally when there are too many enemies or vehicles on screen while raining at the same time. But no, 90 to 95% of the whole game is 10 to 20 frames per second, and it never improves over time. And it's all your fault. My fault? Now I've played this game on the PSP and it has the same problem, but I can somewhat understand it because trying to recreate a full 3D city on a different game engine for a portable console, it has its limitations, and the mobile version and Vice City stories don't have this problem at all. But you would have assumed that the PlayStation 2 version, a port on a more powerful console and being released the same year as Vice City Stories, the latter having almost no slowdown whatsoever, wouldn't have this issue at all. But again, no. It's like they dumped the full PSP file and put it onto a DVD. That is inexcusable. It doesn't make the game virtually unplayable. I was able to complete all the story missions despite the setback, but look at it. It shouldn't have been released like this. If a brand new game today had slowed down like this on launch day, there would be a massive outcry. Not only does it make Liberty City stories look and feel unfinished, but it can also delay the controls by a full second. Staying true to the Grand Theft Auto name, vehicles are everywhere and can be driven, stolen, and enough damage can blow them up. But unlike GTA 3, you have motorbikes too, which is handy, because if you need to take down an enemy in a vehicle, you can shoot it forwards in addition to sideways. Obviously, the reason why there are bikes in Liberty City Stories, not GTA 3, is because they weren't implemented in the 3D universe until Vice City. But I like that there's a reason in-game. Supposedly, motorbikes were banned in Liberty City by 2001, although that's pretty hard to believe if they're in GTA 4. Despite being a handheld game, you have around 80 songs and a talk show across 10 radio stations. And if you don't like any of these, like San Andreas, you can import your own music to a custom station. But obviously you can't do that in the PS2 version. You also have trains and ferries. But what's the point if driving to your intended location is faster? It makes sense to have them because in this timeline, the bridge is under construction. 
repairs its closed even if you can technically drive through it. Anyway, point being, I can beat this game having never used the train or ferry, but if there's one vehicle I wish it had, it's one that can fly. Because the only planes and helicopters you see here are piloted by others. They should have at least implemented helicopters because the game designers worked it out by the time Vice City was released. There's a huge trend going on here. The gameplay mechanics are almost identical to GTA 3. You can't fly, jump on ledges, crouch, nor swim. Seriously, what is Liberty City's problem? Is the water secretly blue colored acid? Or did nobody learn to swim at an early age? Because it's not just you that can drown instantly. It's frustrating because it would come in handy if you accidentally fall off the edge of a bridge or something. The only thing about the controls that have been improved from GTA 3 is being able to rotate the camera, which isn't as self-explanatory as you'd expect with the PSP. When you fire a weapon, it locks the camera straight at the enemy, and you can take down a wave in a matter of seconds. However, you can't crouch behind a cover spot. To be fair, what's the best control scheme to crouch when playing this on the PSP? But this makes it virtually impossible to avoid gunfire even a little bit, and I recommend having full health and armor before every mission, because all you're doing is moving and shooting. Enemies are more accurate than you, and they can crouch on ledges or cars. Sometimes I need something explosive, literally, just to get them without taking too much health. What, are you gonna run the mommy? Are you gonna jump on daddy's knee? Ask for a wet kiss? The controls are good enough to get what needs to be done, and with the exception of one mission, I never needed more than three attempts to complete them all. But I don't understand why they didn't just copy the control elements from San Andreas and implement it into Liberty City stories. At the very least, they should have allowed you to swim and crouch. I know the city wasn't designed for those controls in mind, but I wouldn't be surprised if the initial plan was to make a PSP port of GTA 3. I guess you could say that Rockstar Leeds wanted to play it a little bit safe, because they never worked on a game this complex at the time. Rockstar revolutionized video gaming in 2001 with Grand Theft Auto 3, and only four years later they were already making the same thing on a portable console. Like GTA 3 before, if it worked, the developers would have a better understanding of how the PSP hardware works and expand their scope, hence why they released Vice City Stories. There isn't much to say in terms of other things to do in Liberty City, because the tasks required to complete 100% are very similar to GTA 3, including phone booths, street races, unique stunt bonuses, car collecting, 100 hidden items, rampage tokens, and community-based missions. Sure, Dump Trucks and Pizza Boy weren't in GTA 3, but they never made any further appearances in future GTA main series titles, an obvious indication of what gamers thought of these. The phone booths aren't located on the map, nor do you know what type of mission they trigger. So make sure you save your progress before you answer the phone. Completing all the missions, tasks, and finding the hidden items, cars, etc. 100% will unlock weapons outside the safe house, just like the predecessors, and a rhino. It's safe to assume you won't be able to 100% complete this game with one full charge of battery. But you can get a lot of excitement from the realization of being in the city without rules, with one full charge of battery. Apart from the slowdown and additional weapons, rampaging feels exactly like GTA 3, from the wanted system to the aggression of the police. Like every GTA title that came before or after, rampaging never gets boring and almost makes you forget that it's running at 10 to 20 frames per second. It will always be the best thing about Grand Theft Auto. Survival and action beyond outlandish. Back in 2005, Grand Theft Auto Liberty City Stories was the equivalent of a slightly compromised port of Grand Theft Auto 4, or even 5, on the PlayStation Vita, without the use of remote play. Because back then, 3, Vice City, and San Andreas were the latest titles in the main series. You have this one that comes close to the predecessors, and you have the convenience of taking it wherever you go. It's a shame we don't have other GTA titles released for the Nintendo Switch, 3DS, or PS Vita. Sure, these three came out for the mobile, but it would be better to play these on dedicated handheld consoles because they'd be easier to control. Instead, we have these two. 
selling nearly 8 million copies, making Liberty City Stories the best selling title on the PSP, and one of the reasons you bought one, it deserved all the praise and success it got back in 2005. We did it Tony! Whatever. But like the rest of the 3D Universe titles, it's really showing its age. The biggest problem is that slowdown. I wasn't able to enjoy this game as much as I could have, and it ruins what is otherwise a solid entry in the GTA series. Like I don't want to come back to it the same way I would with GTA 3. I would only recommend this if you really, really want to experience Liberty City on the go. The best version to get would be the mobile, because the slowdown is eliminated, but don't get the PlayStation 2 version, you might as well play GTA 3 instead. Liberty City Stories was another great example of Rockstar's talent on a new console, but play it at your own risk.